to some extent, religion is there to teach people to be a little bit better. We see God in different way. That's good. Believe what you want to believe. Like work the best that you can at that belief. You know. You either have to have faith, or you just have to live your life knowing that this is your one shot, and just give it your best shot. I don't think it's about being right or wrong. As long as your faith helps you be a better person, I don't care what you believe in. Five centuries ago, in taverns and public houses across Europe, the masses would gather for discussion and debate over the latest ideas sweeping the land. From one such meeting place, a small Cambridge inn called the White Horse, the Reformation came to the English-speaking world. Carrying on the tradition, welcome to the White Horse Inn. Hello and welcome to another edition of the White Horse Inn.、Uh, I'm really excited because we're starting a new series on the resurrection, focusing specifically on the claim and the challenges. And the latest New Testament scholarship is going to be the focus of this series, so that you can have greater confidence, hope, and joy in the faith that we profess. You know, the claim that Jesus rose from the dead is not only the earliest claim of the Christians, but it's also the central claim. The Apostle Paul tells us that it is of first importance to believe that Jesus Christ was crucified according to the Scriptures, was buried, and on the third day rose again. And you know, that's what connects our faith more than anything else to history. Imagine for a moment that you receive the following strange answers in response to the question, "Where was the Declaration of Independence signed?" Here's one: My family always raised me to believe that it was signed in Dayton, Ohio. Or how about this one? You hear, for some people, it was signed in Austin, Texas, and for others, it was signed in Santa Fe, New Mexico. But the important thing is where you think it was signed. Or how about this? Believing that the Declaration was signed in my hometown really makes me feel good about myself. Or I was invited to a place with really friendly people who believed that it was signed in Chicago. I'm just amazed at the sincerity and the awesomeness of that group. Or you move to the subject of math. How do you think you would respond if you received the following answers to a basic math question, such as, "What is five times twenty-five?" Well, here's one. It's narrow-minded to think that there's only one right answer. All answers are equally valid. Or I'm a free spirit, and I just follow my intuition. I think I'm going to go with 42. Or belief in the unique properties of the number 26 has really changed my life. Therefore, I know in my heart that the answer is 26. It's given me my best life now. Or who has time for questions like these? It's all so complicated, and who really cares anyway? At the end of the day, no one can really know what five times 25 really is. You're beginning to get the point. We don't actually live like this in the real world, and we shouldn't with our faith. The Christian faith, founded on the resurrection, connects us to things that really happened in dateable history, and that's what we're going to talk about with our、uh, panel here. As we listen to answers on the street, I want you to be thinking about some of those analogies that I just mentioned, and and see how differently people, particularly in America, wall off their quote unquote faith from. Their real life thinking about the world and reality, and we have、uh, your usual hosts Kim Riddlebarger and Rod Rosenblatt, and also Craig Parton, who is a partner at the Olds Law Firm in Santa Barbara, California, and the author of The Defense Never Rests. Craig, it's a pleasure to have you with us on this series. Thanks, Mike. My pleasure. And I'm Mike Horton. I'm recently back from sabbatical and、uh, back surgery. Looking forward to、uh, addressing this central claim of the Christian faith. Let's. Start listening to some of these answers that Shane Rosenthal, our producer, heard when he recorded these interviews. First of all, on religious belief. What's your take of religion? Is it a good thing, bad thing? Are you different? I think it's good,、uh, depending on、uh, each culture. They view their religion differently. Are you religious or not religious?、Uh, I was brought up Catholic, but、uh, I go to church whenever I feel like it.、Um, How do I know that my religious view is the right one, and all the other religions are wrong? What's your take? I think I don't really、uh, know, but I think that to each his own. It teach to some extent religion is is there、um, to teach people to be a little bit better, not as selfish. 
and uh, culturally, you know, we see God in different way, different um, whatever, then that's good. I don't agree with uh, people who are too zealous, like uh, regardless if it's Catholic or Buddhist or uh, Muslim or whatever. I, I, I don't agree with that view. What do you think about religion? Well, I think it's good. It all depends on uh, what are the people thinking, you know, but I'm a Catholic, so I'm thinking that religion is good. But there are a lot of different religions in the world. Why do you think your religion is the right way compared to all the other faiths? That's why my father and mother and the uh, rest of my family, what uh, he teach me when I was young. So that's what I believe in to be a Catholic. Don't a lot of Muslim parents teach their kids to be Muslims? Don't a lot of Hindu parents teach their kids to be Hindus? So wouldn't they say the same thing? Well, the Catholic people, I think most of the Catholic people is a good person, you know, and like every time is doing the right way to be in church, uh, helping uh, poor people, old people. You've heard this before from a lot of different quarters. How about, first of all, the subjective individualism of it to it, each his own to each his own sure sure sums it up and that it would be impossible to ever come to a religious decision on the basis of objective evidence um, that isn't even part of the discussion so we're driven to what satisfies me and I found one that satisfies me religion is not about facts it's about faith if I've heard that once, mm -hmm. I've heard it a zillion yeah. times, and faith covers all kinds of subjective experiential approaches, whereas facts actually have a right or a wrong answer and can yeah. be investigated. Yeah. Yeah. Don't you think that that's the basic change that needs to happen in our apologetic conversations to move it, even if they don't come to the conclusion sure. that the evidence is very noteworthy, that to move the dial, the needle, from faith as a subjective hunch to at least claims being made in the same yeah. realm as other historical yeah, claims. We pastors haven't gotten across at all uh, what saving faith is and what it isn't. And so we've allowed the culture to drift into faith as epistemology, which of course is foreign well, to the explain, New Testament. Un unpack that, faith as well, epistemology. Faith is not a way of knowing as opposed to empirical fact or logic math and so forth. That's not how the New Testament discusses it. It talks uh, about many aspects of faith. The Reformation focused in on what is saving faith, but it never was a an alternative way of knowing. Mm -hmm. That's such an important it's, point. It's a great point. The other thing I thought was interesting was how you move from individual subjectivism and moralism to cultural relativism that yes. basically where you were raised determines sure. what religion you are what do you say to somebody who says well yeah but how do i know that christianity is true if that's all i've ever known i was raised in a bible believing church and is the difference between me and my muslim friend at high school basically that i was raised in a christian environment and he wasn't if that's all the Christian faith amounts to, uh, its real worth in the marketplace is, is zero. If all we are is captive to our lineage or our culture, then truth claims go out the window. And the New Testament's got an interesting look at how the original people who had contact with the resurrected Christ were brought to the position that it was true, even though a number of them thought this is a wacky concept. I mean, you look at Thomas, you look at a number of the apostles 15 seconds after the crucifixion, and they've spread, taken off. Yep. They weren't predisposed to believe this was true. They were brought to this recognition by the facticity of the resurrection. Mm -hmm. yeah. The other thing I picked up, and I'm sure we're going to see it again, is the spirit of William James lives. The idea that a religion its value to the individuals based on its experiential worth. Bang for the buck. Bang for the buck, as, as James said. And what that produces to the men on the street is the idea that religion is about making people better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. if they're too zealous, well, then they've missed the point. The point of religion is, I'm going to get along with people better. And that's exactly what you argue. Yeah, back to your point, Mike, about the apologetical approach today. 
I mean, we'd be, I think, well served to see how it was defended originally. You look in the book of Acts and you see the approach of the apostles. This was not done in a corner. Check it out yourself. Talk People are to still the alive. People are still alive. Cross-examine them. There's none of this, well, I just had a wonderful experience and you should try it too. Yeah. Yeah. Dear Theophilus, I'm writing this to you, yeah. Luke says, uh, be- after having made an orderly investigation of the facts. Uh, it, it's... Classic. Seemed good to me also that you would be uh, acquainted with what happened. Right, right. And or I'm... Peter saying we wasn't cleverly devised myths, but we were eyewitnesses yep. of these yeah. events. Paul telling Roman officials, as you yourselves know, this thing was not done in a corner. Yeah. Let's listen to a couple more. Believe what you want to believe, like believe and work the best that you can at that belief. You know, people believe what they want to believe because that's. It gives them comfort, you know, like, oh, when I die, I'm going to this place, so they have something to build up to, you know, when they die. Like, it's, Do you think that's what religion is, is about comfort in the here and now? Yeah, very much. Out of thousands of different beliefs, so the Muslims believe this and the Hindus believe that, and, okay. well, there's so many different beliefs, right. how do you think you can beat the odds? Is it just what you want to believe, or? Um, I believe everyone has a right to choose what they want to believe in. Everybody believes what they want to believe is true. The question is, what are the chances of that desire of what I want to be true actually being the right view? Um, Well, no one knows. It's it's just how life is. It's just you either have to have faith or you just have to just live your life knowing that this, this is your one shot and just give it your best shot. One of the, the recurring things that you hear, not only from these interviews, but from a lot of conversations with folks, is this whole idea that nobody knows. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if yeah. nobody In the knows, realm of religion. In the realm of religion. This isn't like the realm of going shopping and knowing what things cost or knowing what happened in history or knowing that two plus two equals four. Well, here's the dilemma, right? As you said, it's the subjective is conquering everything. But it intrigued me that you can't know anything about religion except that you know which one's right for you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, and, and there was it's no... It's shopping. Yeah, it's basically. shopping. And yeah. it, there was no sense in which my final conclusion that's any different from anybody else's, I just know you can't make a final conclusion for me. So when people basically talk about, quote unquote, their faith today, it's not unlike my shopping preferences. I really found this great deal at Target. I love shopping at... Uh, Nordstrom. Yeah. Or my favorite color. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and no apology given for not having more than that. But see, the, the, benefit no of, the benefit of taking that position is it can't be refuted. Right, right. So no one's going to take you on and say, oh, you, yeah. you know, your yeah. choice is incorrect. Yep. Yeah, it's my religion. Right, yeah. right. I came to this through whatever happenstance it would be, and it can't be refuted or yep. contradicted. Yep. Don't you think that that actually is what motivates a lot of anger over religion, what makes it difficult to actually have a conversation is that it's my personal faith. Yes. And I don't know why I believe it. Right. And I I do know you're attacking it. But it's very personal to me. Yep. And you get out of my space right now or I'm going to club you. Yep. And to the extent that people do know what they believe and why they believe it, not just Christians, but in other religions, they can sit around a table and dialogue and engage and disagree and argue without getting all huffy because they say it's not personal. It's something that I embrace that actually has some kind of objective claim outside of me and my personal shopping preferences. And of course, we're, and we're going to come to it later. And Christianity sits there, as Paul does, and says, if this didn't happen, mm-hmm. it should be refuted. We should all be a lot better off taking a different position yeah, if this is, yeah, let's go home. Though. Yeah. And isn't that the bottom line? We've got to see that religion in general may make a lot of claims that fit what people on the street are saying. Yes. But Christianity, whatever you want to say about religion in general, Christianity is a different kind of claim. Yeah. Yep. When was the last time, if at all, any of these folks heard a winsome case made for Christianity being a truth claim? Yeah. That that the Christmas story isn't just a story, it's a historical narrative that this child was actually born, grew to manhood, fulfilled the righteous requirements of the law, mm-hmm. suffered, 
died and was raised from the dead, as opposed to Jesus being perpetual babe in the manger, the soft sentiments of Christmas, you know, the same with Easter, morphed into a secular shopping holiday and chocolate and Easter bunnies. And, you know, it, yeah. I wonder if any of these people have ever heard from the church, the Christian church, that case actually being made that we worship a, a flesh and blood savior. I bet not. Yeah. yeah. I think it's very rare that somebody can present their faith in terms of a factual claim. Yes. It's it's almost unheard of. And my concern is is certainly that people out on the street aren't hearing this from other from Christians who are trying to present the faith once delivered, but churches aren't presenting it to right. their own people. Yeah. Right. Right. No, exactly. And uh, I, I remember a while back uh, being on a panel with Bill Nye, the science guy, and he was making the argument that religious claims are inherently subjective. dubious yeah. and subjective. Yep. And it was basically debunking religious claims. And at the, at the end of it, it was basically David Hume. Sure. Uh, mm -hmm. At the end of it, it came to me and I, I said, well, first of all, I have to say that I agree with 90% of what Bill Nye was just saying about religious claims. Now I'd like to talk about the resurrection of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And it, it moved things into a different category. Yep. It was interesting. After that event, we kept up a conversation and, and I was giving him actual you right. know, arguments and evidence that I hadn't gone into in that panel. And uh, he said, no, it's just all bunk. I, well, which parts of it? Let's talk about the specifics. And he, no, he was exercising the same kind of subjective dogmatism yes. with his faith yes. as the people we're hearing in these street interviews. He's exercising the same kind of subjective dogmatic faith that he's accusing everybody else of doing. So it's the yeah. secularists who are yeah. doing this, not yeah. just sure. yeah. The, yeah. the sort of turn your mind off. Yeah. Uh, and they know a priori. Mm -hmm. They know before the case that no matter what you're going to say, it's got to be false. Let's listen to some more clips. I don't think it's about being right or wrong. I think it's about as long as your faith helps you be a better person, I don't care what you believe in. In light of the fact that there are so many different faiths, literally thousands, hundreds yeah. of thousands, whatever you believe, chances are you're wrong, right? I mean, that could be the possibility. You could be right, too. I mean, right, but the odds are against you. Like, statistically, yeah, they're little odds. Yeah, it's low, but ultimate reality is just you living life yourself, you know, like being happy as you're alive, like not trying to work for something, just working for what you want to do. Like, I'm making good money. Everything's really good. So I'm pretty happy the way I'm living right now. I'm not really thinking about death at all. You hear that more, I think, now than you used to. It used to be more of the subjective moralism, but now you get layered on top of that, it seems to me an unabashed consumeristic narcissism. Everything is really about my being happy and comfortable and making money today. Is that correct? There's a kind of ultimate things are really of no significance. Really, it's today am I making money, having a good time, enjoying a good life? I mean, doesn't Paul say this basically, that if Christ has not been resurrected, eat, drink, and be merry. Yeah. Be hedonism. Yes. Go makes, shopping. It, it Really, it yes. makes complete sense to me. Kate Ashbury <laughs> made a lot of sense to my generation that rejected Christ. I mean, the eat, drink, and be merry is the same thing as sex, drugs, and rock and roll. These guys who answer the questions on the surface level about personal happiness, A, the reality is bad things do happen to them. What do they do then? Uh, what if things go to vinegar quickly? What if he finds out in two weeks he's got cancer and is shortly to die? That stuff evaporates pretty quickly. And so those kinds of answers work in a culture that is extremely While affluent. you're happy. Right. Yeah, while you're happy. Yes. It does make perfect sense, but you're not always happy. Yeah. Then what do you do? A 25-year-old with their health and a good job is going to answer it differently than yeah. somebody facing death straight yeah. on. Let's listen to a couple more. Uh, are you a religious person or not a religious person? Man of faith, yes. Man of faith, okay. Christian. So in light of the fact that it's one among many, I mean, literally there are thousands of different belief systems out there, how do you know that your belief is the right one? Uh, I don't believe there's a right belief. I just have a, a belief I think is, is the right one. So you see faith then as a subjective leap? Yes. Okay. But at some point, everyone has to kind of make a decision, right? Yeah. All right. But the, I guess the question would be, how do we make that in light of the fact that I'm probably wrong? If I'm literally one out of thousands, it's not good odds that my particular leap is the right one, right? No, I think all faiths are good. Uh, as long as you believe in something in a higher power, 
that uh, they all take different shapes and. But isn't that itself a faith leap? Just the belief that all fates are okay. That's one of those thousands of leaps, right. and the, aren't the odds still against you? Yeah. No, I, I yeah, I agree. So, how do I know that what I like to be true is going to match that reality? I mean, you don't in faith you don't deal with rational things. In life, you deal with rational things, and that's what you have to deal with. So, faith you're just leaving it up. You know, got to believe in something. So, or you don't have to believe in something, but I choose to. So. Are you religious? Are you not yeah. religious? What do you think about yeah. life after death? All that stuff. Not religious at all. Um, organized religion in a whole has been like so problematic and hypocritical that like most of all organized religions have always seemed to like had have like a darker side that no one really knows about and it just kind of gets shoved under the rug. In my opinion, I know that Jesus and God isn't real only because those are human-made concepts. But you can't have a human-made concept that defines out like otherworldly things you know like you can't have human ideas account for things that are outside of earth and outside of humans in my opinion and just doesn't really make sense at all to me but that is an idea about the afterlife is it still i guess so yeah so in light of the fact that there are thousands of ideas about the afterlife and yours is one of a thousand what chance do you have of being right little to none <laughs> Little to none. I think everyone has little to no chance of being right. I don't think that anyone's really can really actually say what happens until you actually die. Wow, little to none. Yeah. I thought it was effective the way uh, first you asked if he was religious, he said no, and they assume that therefore they don't have any final positions on issues of life and death. Everybody does. Everybody's a philosopher. Everybody's a theologian. Yeah. It's just a matter of probing that, which I think that question did. I mean, you have no, no basis for what you believe at all. He finally conceded that was the case. But as right. Shane pointed out to him, and he, he had conceded, he did have a point of view. He yes, said he exactly. didn't, but he does he have a point yeah. of view. One thing, too, from a couple of the responses back is this confusion of pluralism, political pluralism, with religious pluralism. In other words, because all religions should be tolerated politically, the state yes. doesn't have the authority to get its hands involved in deciding which religion is true, does not mean that all religions are equal. But you hear this all the time, yes. and not just on the street, don't you? Well, yes. you do hear it all the time, and you hear it in part because so many churches are so politicized that their message is essentially political. Why would you not jump to that conclusion? Yeah, if, people if, talk about the evangelical vote. Yeah. It's interesting that the person who said all faiths are good is a Christian. First of all, don't you have to discriminate between quote-unquote faiths that ask you to sacrifice your child or sure. lead you to gas six million Jews sure. versus faiths that actually promote good? Yeah, You have to ask, is this person had contact with biblical Christianity no. at all. Can you imagine yeah, the first century? You. Yeah, can you imagine the one. early believers responding this way? You know, all religions are good. Everybody has their own faith. But I'm going to die for this one because I just feel like it. <laughs> right. It makes me happy. Right. Yeah. Amazing. Almost all of these folks define religion as essentially ethics. And the assumption is, well, Christianity is a, just another ethical system. And as Rod's pointing out, where is the catechesis that tells people that Christianity is not essentially a religion of ethics, it's essentially a religion of rescue? Yep. It's the whole story Category of God mistake. coming in Christ to save us from our sin. I think that is so foreign to the way these folks are thinking, and I think it's foreign because the church is sadly silent when it comes to the message of redemption. It used to be people had some idea that well, let's talk about getting saved. The, the church hasn't talked about getting saved in so long, it's not a category anymore. Uh -huh. Right, and I think there's some confusion about, are we teaching the exclusive claims of Christianity, the John fourteen six kind of point, I am the way, the yeah. truth, and the uh -huh. life, yeah. and yet not falling into that makes us intolerant of all other religions. It's right. a completely different discussion. We can have exclusive claims yep. and still be completely opened in a society that allows other people to come to whatever conclusion they want to come to. Yep. In fact, if you say that I'm a Christian because it makes people better, if you're basically reducing it to that moral argument, you're actually being really arrogant. Our claim is not that we're better than everybody else. Yep. Our claim is not that our families are happier and healthier and 
only if you become a Christian can you possibly have a good family and be a good God honoring, loving American. Yep. <laughs> We're claiming we are chief among sinners and need to be rescued. But look at the chief representatives of Christianity in the media, Joel Osteen, T.D. Jakes, and they're all saying the exact opposite. The Christianity makes you a better person, makes you successful and happy. Yeah, it can only, that can only lead to arrogance that everybody else obviously isn't happy or successful. Yeah, and looming over all of that is the problem of evil. In other words, during good times, that's relatively easy to say. Let catastrophe happen, and it's more difficult. Don't know what yeah. to do with it. As Lewis says, a sharp pain in the side, and the whole philosophy comes down like a house of cards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's listen to another clip. I think religion is fun, but I think as people, we need to acknowledge humanity prior to that. We need to say, look, we're all on this rock together. But you just said need, implying that we should. I yeah. wouldn't say that we need, I mean, as people, I think that is helpful, a helpful perspective to take. This is my opinion. Um, I think a helpful perspective to take is that we're, we're just humans on a rock together. And some people like to think that there's something else going on. And some people like to think that there's not. Christian Smith calls this moralistic therapeutic deism, right? The purpose of religion is to make you happy, to give you peace of mind. Everyone we're hearing from is saying that is that is what we're hearing, right? Yeah. But what if my religion says it makes me happy to eat you? <laughs> How does that work? <laughs> right. I mean, there's boundaries to this already, logically, and, and just yeah. But as a wouldn't they say, well, as long as you're not bringing harm to someone else, do well? Yeah. But that makes me happy. Things like uh -huh. that make me happy. Taking away your rights, making you a second-class citizen, cutting off your hand, all that makes me happy and fulfills my religion. Yeah. And don't I have the right to express that? Right. No, we don't. Right. We, no one acts that, operates that way. Yeah. Uh, let's listen to another clip. So the question is, how do we get to the place where we believe in the true thing? And that's what I'm exploring in these conversations. You're never going to find that because the true thing is going to be different with every person because it's their journey. The truth is their journey. Isn't that interesting? The truth is their yeah. journey. It's not a journey toward truth. Right. The truth is the journey. Now, say that about, about a historian writing about the Napoleonic Wars. Yeah, or the Blitz of London. Yeah. Well, it's not what actually happened. It's the journey of the author. Your the, initial question about the location of the signing of the Declaration of Independence and the subjective answers, I mean, that just collides with reality pretty quick. Wasn't it Francis Schaeffer used to talk about the importance of taking the roof off, and by that he meant letting these people who live in uh, an imaginary world run into the real world once in a while? How can you live like that yeah. on a daily basis? Uh, we've been basically looking at what is technically called religious epistemology. How do people think about religion? And now we're looking at the, particularly the belief in God. Does God exist? And let's listen to some of those clips now. I have no idea if there's God or not. I mean, everybody has their religion, they're Christian, they're Buddhist, they're Muslim, all that stuff like that. I don't really know. Quran and the Bible sound very similar, very similar. So, I mean, I don't believe in religion very much. I'm not religious at all. But I'm not saying there's not a God. I'm not saying, like, oh, when we die, we just die. Or I'm not saying if we die, we go to hell or not. I don't really know. I mean, my take on life is I'm alive now, and if I'm a good person, hey, maybe heaven does exist. I know I'm going to go there if, if such things kind of happen, you know? I don't really think about it too much. I think to assume you, a human being, know enough about the universe to decide for a fact there is or isn't a god is just you being arrogant. There's definitely a higher power. There's always one. You have energy all around you, everything from gravity that makes everything stay on the ground to the flower bloom and the air blowing, you know? You have the earth, you have Mother Nature, you know, you have all these things. Uh, I think it wa I waver throughout my lifetime. I think uh, when I was younger, I wanted to believe there was a God. As I got older, I had a lot of doubt, and then I began to think that maybe we are God ourselves. We are the gods of our lives. While we're alive and when we're dead, it may not matter anymore <laughs> to us what we think because we're gone. It's like we're in a, you know, a sleep for eternity. I don't have a fear of a hell or a something to that effect. If we go to hell, I guess I'm ready to face that because it's, the, it's what I chose. 
Yeah, I mean, we're never gonna know. I think there's a big question mark over the, the world that says we're never gonna know for real. I don't know. I, I'm really just trying to figure out what I believe right now. I think that the thing that is true is that we all have some kind of yearning to want to know. Why do you think we do? Because it seems death so... Scary, scary. Yeah, death is scary and life seems kind of weird if it's meaningless, I guess. Wow, there's so much here. One thing I have not heard yet is an argument or even a statement of actual belief that happens to exist somewhere outside of the gooey insides of the individuals. Yeah, all pure subjective. Yeah, are, are you saying anything that can be checked out outside of your innards? Yeah. I mean, that's how you kind of know that you're actually presenting New Testament biblical Christianity is if people can actually check out what you're saying. Yeah, yes. or that they're bumping into actual reality. You can't really have a conversation with people. People think that you're going to get into this horrible argument if you actually present dogmatic claims. People would say we're dogmatic sure. because sure, we actually would. have beliefs sure. that we would like to, to defend and sure. claims we'd like to make before people. But isn't this actually dogmatic? Sure. Well, well, there were a couple who I think, giving them the benefit of the doubt, said, I don't know. And I think that's, a, yeah. that's an honest answer to an honest question. And I think part of that is Christians may not have given them reason to <laughs> look beyond that I don't know face. The other comment I thought was interesting was the gal saying she was yearning and that humans yearn for something beyond. Yeah. I think you know, there's a, a pretty good illustration of somebody acknowledging the basic human need and having no clue what to do with it. Yeah. But at least acknowledging that people yearn for something beyond themselves, for meaning and for purpose in life. Which and, is what I ha hadn't heard from anybody yeah, yeah, else. Right. Everything else right. was, no, I have no yearning for anything transcending my own happiness day by day. Hearing those responses makes me realize the importance of the fact that we're not defending mere theism. Yes. yes. You know, yes. you get balled up in these discussions and it's all yes. off Does on, God exist? Yeah, instead yep. of getting to the Christological center yeah. of mm -hmm. the apologetical task, which is a fact that can be checked out in history. Well, what you find, too, is people on, on one hand, when they are in science mode, they are naturalists, they're atheists, yeah. essentially. Yeah. Then they switch over to their quote-unquote faith or spirituality mode, and they're the most anti-rational mystics. Yeah, Francis Schaeffer, again, had that pegged decades ago that characterizes our culture that when you shift to religion, you go anti-rational. The key is to get the conversation shifted to the, the issue of facts and the facts yep. that are at... Yeah at issue in the case for Christianity. People think when you're talking about religion, it's an opinion. Craig, I want to speak on behalf of your discipline because the law is about the last thing left where people in the culture will talk about facts. Now, I'm going to make an admission. I'm going to pay for this. But one of the places that you see the collision of the subjective and the objective is in a show like Judge Judy. Because people will come in and say, I think so-and-so, and she'll appeal. I don't care what you think. It's the law. The law says. Right. I mean, the, the reason for that is, I mean, at the center of every legal dispute is a factual dispute. Yes. And the law goes down and says, we're going to come to a verdict and we're going to come to a decision. You philosophers can philosophize till the cows come home. We're going to give you a verdict and a decision that's going to be based on what the facts actually yeah. are. Yeah. We're about to listen to some clips on views of life after death from these street interviews that Shane conducted. But sort of as a transition to that, I thought that one of the comments that really stood out to me in that last block was the woman who said that if there is a hell, it's okay because it's what I chose. Yes. The oh. God, yes. the God in the West today is the will. The, the sovereign, sovereign will. will. My I sovereign chose. will. The right to choose even if all other obligations are victims of the that. The last vestige of the Enlightenment. At least I chose it. Yeah. Well, that's Lewis's comment in The Great Divorce, right? They're out there in the edges of hell, but I showed them. I made my decision. I'm here by my own act of my will. And all of the heavens say, hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, really, you, people need to realize the cosmos doesn't care right. about your will. Uh, another <laughs> illustration <laughs> from the great C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce was the bishop who came up from hell to the gates of heaven and his friend from heaven said, you know, if you remember back to our little theological discussion group, 
All we were really doing was repeating what our culture said. If we'd been brave, we would have gone against what our culture at the time was saying, but we didn't. And all of these remind me of that conversation in The Great Divorce because the theme is the same with every single answer. My subjective rule decides everything, and there could be no other answer. There could be no other approach. Here are some questions uh, that Shane asked about, quote-unquote, life after death. What's your view of life after death? Do you think we just die and that's it, or do you think there's a heaven or a hell? I believe there's reincarnation. Help me with this. You're a Catholic, but you believe in reincarnation. Isn't that sort of like a cafeteria, uh, you know, food? Yeah, that's illogical, but, you know, what can I say? How do you know that your way is right? Because only one thing is going to happen when we die. So how do you know your way is the right way? Uh... I can't answer that because there's no right or wrong way. It's just individually what you think. So what if I said that about history or math? You know, there is no first president of the United States. It's just yeah, whatever but, you want but, it to be. But see, you're putting it in a different context. Math is you you do a formula yeah. and uh, it's proven. Yeah. Uh, history, something happened, you know. Is you the problem that death is unknown? We can't peer into it? Yeah. So then it's just whatever you want it to be ends up being the truth? Uh, that's very possible. I just believe in karma. Whatever you do, you know, if you do right, you're going to get right. If you do wrong, you get wrong. And I believe in, in the reincarnation because I think that if we, let's say we die and we did a lot of bad things now, hopefully when we become another person or another being, we can be a better person. But in light of all the different views about that, isn't your particular one small view one out of thousands? And don't you have a small chance of being right? Possible. So what do you what do you do? Would you just throw your hands up and say, who knows? Yeah. To that to that question, yes. How would you all respond to that statement that we can't really peer into the question of what happens after death. From the Christian perspective, how would you make the apologetic argument that we can, as Christians, have the, some indication of what happens? The only happens? way would be if somebody conquered it. Yeah, somebody went through it and came back and told us about it. History is the realm, he acknowledged, was a realm where things happened. That's not the realm of faith and religious beliefs. What if the Christian claim is that something happened in history. Does that tell you what happens after death? Sure. He would be in a unique position. Somebody who actually conquered death would be in a unique position to explain why and how. And, in fact, Jesus does that. do that. During the 40 days before his ascension, he made clear what was going on to his disciples and that's unique. In other words, if you take that as a category and survey religions, you're not going to find a whole bunch of repetition of that. Even if you look into the myths, the thing that makes myth myth is that it's always and never, nowhere and everywhere. Yeah. Not At this particular in, time while Quirinius was governor of that's Syria. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. the opposite. You say Jesus was alive again after being three days dead, and the response is, gee, what makes you so arrogant? Right. It's like arrogance is associated with factual claims. Yes. Yeah. In religion, which is bizarre, because in every other area, factual claims don't mean you're arrogant. Scientists who, mm-hmm. who are doing tests yep. and come to conclusions about the truth of a scientific test aren't called arrogant. Yeah. Or historians, like Mike mentioned, who's the first president of the United States, you're not considered arrogant for knowing the answer to that. Uh-huh. But you start asserting truth claims on facts related to ultimate questions, and people call you arrogant. Life after death? I'm not sure. Could be, we could transform into... Anything, a tree, a, a flower, grass, a spirit. Oh, you go into the ground, and that's it. Nothing wrong with the body. The body is a piece of meat. I don't think the soul ever dies. You know, our body, yeah. Whether the soul goes up into a heaven, or you get reincarnated into somebody else, you know, you're reborn. Um, 
it's really the last ultimate adventure that everybody waits to find out. One of the things that's really striking about these responses to me is that we're we're back to paganism. Yeah. Yes. We're, we're yeah. now yeah. back to yeah. exactly the worldview of the first Christians. Yes. That, that, that the first right. Christians faced. I yes. really chafe when I hear Christians talk about Christian America as though America is a Christian country. Listen to these answers and then tell me that this is not as pagan as the Roman Empire. Right. Sure. Or that it's so bad right now. It, things have never been as degraded as they are morally we're, now. Go back to the first century. Sure. Right. They turned the, the, the world century. upside down yep. with that yeah. message. Yeah. Yep. With truth claims. With truth claims. Exactly. Yeah. Lisa Miller, a number of years ago in Newsweek magazine, wrote an interesting article. This is Newsweek magazine. We're all Hindus now. And based on statistics, she showed that on numerous points, reincarnation being one, uh -huh. there is no difference between Christians and Hindus and Buddhists, Catholics or Protestants uh, yeah. in America. Statistically, reincarnation beats resurrection hands down in America today. Sheer numbers. Sheer numbers. Well, and now I'm going to throw out another hypothesis to think about, but we have so much focus in this culture on zombie apocalypses where almost all the pop culture is talking about a resurrection as people coming back in these rotting forms. There's a, there's a quip from Walking Dead where the, the only Christian character says, Jesus talked about a resurrection, but I don't think this is what he was talking about. <laughs> I thought it was a that's, new body. <laughs> that's everywhere in pop culture. Instead of wringing our hands, don't you think that at this point, this is precisely where we need to say, hoorah, we have the best yep. story around, right. and it happens to be true. Yep. This trumps, are you serious, zombie apocalypse? Yep. And maybe yep. I can come back as a better frog if my karma, I get my karma straight this time around. I mean, we've got to get out there with the best news and be able to articulate that. Well, one of the prerequisites of this is you have a church that believes it. Yeah. And one of the things that we're realizing and listening to, to these is at least we're not in a period where people took the resurrection for granted or in a period where they said, well, I'm, I, it doesn't really matter to me, but I guess because I'm an American, I believe Jesus rose from the dead. At least now it's clear yes. this is a pagan country. Yep. And instead of wringing our hands and saying, oh, where did it go? We should say the options have never been clearer and let's make the case for the Christian faith and let the Holy Spirit draw people to himself through his word. And, and make that case at the point of the resurrection. Yes. That's our strong yep. suit. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. It, it is incumbent that the gospel be preached and, if necessary, defended. Yeah. yeah. It's so important. Let's end with that point. The Apostle Paul moved the resurrection out of the category that the Greeks would have put it in out of the category of it's useful, it gives me happiness, moves it over into the category of not it makes my life better than worse, but it is true rather than false. And folks, everything in Christianity rests upon that claim, that Jesus rose from the dead, and if he hasn't, then we're still in our sins. You can't separate theology, your belief about, quote-unquote, the afterlife, what happens when you die? You can't separate those convictions from what you believe about Jesus being raised on the third day. It is the fulcrum of everything that we believe as Christians. Everything hangs on it. And again, Paul puts it in the category of true or false. Either this happened and we're saved or it didn't happen and we're lost. And folks, we'll be with you again next week to continue our discussion of the resurrection where we'll actually construct the argument for the resurrection, especially focusing on 1 Corinthians 15. Look forward to being with you again next time on The White Horse Inn. The White Horse Inn is a listener-supported broadcast. For more information about this program, visit us online at whitehorseinn.org. If you sign up as an innkeeper, architect, or reformer, not only will you get a complimentary subscription to our magazine, Modern Reformation, but you'll also get longer editions of every White Horse Inn broadcast. To find out how to join one of these support programs, click on the support tab of our website, whitehorseinn.org. You can also give us a call at 1-800-890-7556. That's 1-800-890-7556. We'll see you next time at the White Horse Inn.